Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. It is a hot day today. So, we got that AC going. Little ones are out for a jog with the dad. And so, I have some time to read before I have to switch over the laundry. Let us begin. We're dealing with this radical feminist book. In order for us to combat their ideas, you have to accurately comprehend and understand their philosophy, where they're coming from, and not strawman their arguments or make up things about them, because if you want to give a counter-cultural perspective for people to adhere to, you have to be able to refute what it is these people actually believe. That's why I like going through it one by one. So let us begin. What has been happening quietly and for quite some time is women and girls opting out of the old patriarchal bargain. So old patriarchal bargain whereby we traded our sexuality and the work of our lives for security and protection. Well, at least she actually, you know, at least she's accurately defining what the exchanges I mean that's pretty true you get a woman's sex privilege if you make her safe and provide food I mean that's usually the the exchange it kind of just shows how men can be made to work if they just get to get access once in a while Today, fewer women are obliged by economic necessity, social pressure, isolation, or fear to enter or stay in relationships they don't want. Okay, so this is a fascinating point because to enter into or stay in relationships they don't want. I do agree that there's, there's a tough part of women being able to leave willy-nilly, but also it is nice that women can escape in a relationship that they may not be able to. I lived on my own since I was 17. I, looking back, I needed a father figure, so I always had to have a man in my life because my grandfather, my uncles, my dad, no male figure stepped up. And that led to me picking the wrong types of men they were like very mean looking, very muscular, you know, you, you look for a Heraclean type of figure and some of them are abusive and you learn the hard way. And so you're stuck because you don't have anywhere else to go. No job, no car, no education, even if you have a job, it doesn't pay very much for you to have your own apartment. I mean, I, I understand more than many, you know what it's like to actually not have a father figure or any male who will help you and you have to have a man. A relationship essentially where you exchange sex for protection and it's not a fun feeling. That's why I want to do better for my daughters where they will always have a place to go to. They can always come back home if their partner is abusing them and they're stuck because women's shelters and stuff like that are being infiltrated by transgender so even those places won't be safe for us so it's it's complicated you know I asked my grandma about her relationships when she was younger and she said I was just trying to survive you know she had her first kid at 14 and so a lot of women saw that as an escape out of poverty her father sexually abused her so I come from a very dysfunctional family and the women in my family, they seem to always say the same thing, you know, clinging to any man who will have you and then using your body in order to try to keep him because they, none of them had education. None of them could afford to have their own place and raise their kids in a better environment. And none of them were taught by their mothers or their fathers, what kind of person to look for. So the dysfunction builds and builds and I do think it's good that women are able to have a way out of that. It's it's an honest thing to say you'll be lonely if you're 
in a relationship that you're not happy in. One of the worst forms of loneliness is being lonely when you actually have a husband. Because you're lonely on the inside and miserable. And you're just staying just so you can have a place to stay. It's the worst kind of feeling ever. Horrible feeling. It, it literally makes you want to exit this realm. And those women who have survived that know exactly what I'm talking about. But young, unmarried men don't know what that's like because they're they're too young they have no experience and they almost don't want to understand the female perspective so instead of actually hearing what a woman is saying they're just going to attack and call everyone a feminist or whatnot so i get how to them a woman having a way to escape is bad but when they have a daughter whom they love and they made a mistake on picking the guy for them or whatever approving him or whatever Maybe they'll sing a different tune because sometimes that's the only way some of these men can learn is when a guy puts on a front and he starts to slowly change and you have to decide do you love your daughter more than you care about her marriage to that guy? You know, they, they change when it actually happens to them. But when it doesn't happen to them or someone they love, well then they're on their high horse judging everybody. So it's interesting this point she's making. It's all well and good to say that feminism is about women having choices. But what happens when we start making choices in mass that men don't approve of? What happens is a fundamental disturbance in the sexual contract. Okay, so the sexual contract, that's a phrase we should underline. Which, according to theorist Carol Pateman, is the very basis of what we think as a democratic freedom. Interrogating the ideas of Hobbesian social contract. We've read Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan on this channel. Check out that playlist. Petman explains that the fundamental assumptions of enlightenment liberation rely on an enforced power differential between men and women. An unspoken sexual contract whereby women owe men a duty of care, attention, sexual access, and unpaid domestic labor. This, it is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought that wasn't true until I saw red pill Muslim men saying marital rape doesn't exist simply because they deny a man can rape his wife. So she says no, guy grabs her, pushes her head down, and she's like, I don't want it. He can just force it on her because that's what they say, because she's his wife. And he married her, and the con the marriage contract equals consent at any time, whenever he whims. And they only get to judge what a valid excuse is. So if she says, I'm just in a negative mood because I have a death in the family. You know, I, I'm feeling kind of like I want to vomit, anxiety or whatever. That's not good enough for the guy. He's more selfish. He can just, according to them take it as he whims and if you deny that there are men saying this even though you argue with them they'll tell you well no that doesn't exist so it's fascinating especially you don't hear this come from you hear it come from right-wing Christian men who are trying to be more I don't know what they perceive to be alpha which I don't think it is and then you have young, very horny, unmarried, resentful Muslim men in the red pill movement in the manosphere who are addicted to BDSM porn, obsessing with having access to a woman's body no matter what, and if she doesn't give it to him whenever he wants, he will divorce her, kick her out, or marry another woman. So she has an accurate point here when she talks about the sexual contract. You know, because they say, they twist Hadith to be like, well, you're obligated and it's, you know, this, but if you don't do it, I'm going to just force it on you. I'm going to threaten you with hellfire. I'm going to tell you angels are cursing you. I'm going to bully you. I'm going to coerce you. I'm going to put you down. I'm going to emotionally harm your brain. And I'm going to gaslight you. And I'm going to do everything horrible in order to get you to open up. And then when you hate me, when I'm on top of you, I don't care, it's all about me and my needs and how I feel and how you feel is irrelevant because it's all about me squirting. That's pretty much 
what I got from that. Now, I don't think that is the norm, but it is a trend. And when you start seeing those young men, they're not trolling, they're very serious. And if you go with a gender neutral profile, they don't know you're a woman, they'll just tell you plain. And you can even egg them on like, oh, can you explain? And they'll just say what the quiet part out loud. And it's funny, uh, the Muslim community, when you tell them about this stuff, they just attack you, call you names, say all these Arabic words to just tuck fear you. They don't actually address the problem or they gaslight you. No one's saying that. And then meanwhile, you see people saying it. And so they're not trying to fix the problem or help guide those young men, but they're rather they're trying to find loopholes to justify coercing women uh, to always give up the rights over their own bodily sovereignty and autonomy to the man because they're simply married. So they really degrade her to where it's like, you're married to me now, you no longer have control over your body, I pay the rent, therefore you have to open up. You are basically a human fleshlight. This sounds blunt, but if you start documenting, screenshotting, archiving, looking and analyzing, analyzing sorry, the, the statements here from which accounts they follow, you'll begin to draw some patterns. Just takes time if you're really interested in it, uh, which I am. And I'm going to start doing more often and then putting it in some strings of thought because I find it to be a threat. So the sexual aspect is true, she says here, you know. Now, unpaid domestic labor. I, this is fascinating because I have heard the gold diggers say they don't want to do housework because that's a maid's job and they didn't and the guy didn't marry a maid they'd argue and I've heard them argue further that women who will be what basically who will be Cinderella and will do all that they will age faster they'll be more masculine their hands will get dry from chemicals they won't look as pretty and then the men get bored with them and then they end up leaving them for a woman who's more of a Barbie because it's hard for a Barbie to be a Barbie if she's dressed up as the hotel maid. And I found that to be a very interesting perspective because if you look at these wealthy men, they want their woman to look perfect all the time and they do pay for maid services. And the maids have a job in these nice houses because those women don't do that job. So for them, from the gold digger perspective, they feel they're above cleaning and that they're there to be your wife, not to be your maid. It's fascinating, it truly is, because uh, for me it's like, well, then what are you gonna, what are you gonna do all day? Uh, I don't know. But for them, they have a different lifestyle. But I would, I would say you don't have, well, you, I get paid in food, that's how I look at it. So when I do domestic work, he's buying groceries, that's my payment. You can pay someone with something other than fiat currency. See what I'm saying? My husband buys excellent organic food. I turn that food into nourishment by the permission of Allah and everyone's happy. He goes to work. That's, that's the exchange. That's our uh, bartering and trading, right? That's how, we, that's how we do it. That's how we compensate each other. But I understand how it can be harsh for some women to see others with a better lifestyle and uh, want that for themselves because cleaning can be very boring and it could be very tempting to wish you had money to pay someone else to do it but then you're gonna have to find something to do you know you can't just be uh, sitting at a cafe all day if women break the terms of that contract by refusing subservience refusing subservience they deserve to be punished for it. In the course of writing this book, I spoke to countless women who have been punished for it, who carry wounds that ache and relentless reminder of the cost of non-compliance. The cost of non-compliance. Yeah, which just probably turns into coercion, physical threats, you know. So what's interesting about this book is in the beginning, I mean, I really dug into her because of her, her agenda 
you know, something she's saying, but we are, you know, still only scratching the surface of this uh, controversial text, yet there are points where I grant her some standing and other points where I'm just flat out, you know, I don't agree with that or I give a counterpoint and that makes a good book. What makes a good book and a fair textual analysis and book review is where someone can understand that perspective with the principle of charity and where you would also hold their feet to the fire and, you know, ask for more, right? Really extract the thoughts from their brain more effectively. And so this book isn't just black and white. She does provide some gray area, which is great. I love that. And I really enjoy it and I hope you do as well. Let me know what you think because it's interesting how as the time goes on, the more I see the different branches of the Muslim community, different behaviors from different countries, you know, looking at my own American current culture from the secular, from the liberals, from the conservatives and all that stuff, you're like, wow, you know, she's, she has some points in this area and some in not, and then I am able to synthesize the information more effectively and follow her train of reasoning more accurately because being involved in the culture war, you get to hear a lot of different points of view. So this book is an exercise and hearing the opposition's point of view, which is very beneficial because we don't want to stay in an echo chamber now, do we? So let me know what you think and type out a good comment. Let's see what you got to say. By the way, if you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Hope to see you there.